Hey there. Welcome back for another episode of Legal Marketing Radio. This week, we're talking about a topic that's a little outside the box from our normal digital marketing discussions, but I think it's one that's really important for law firms of all sizes, and I think you'll agree. We're talking about how to keep your confidential data secure from hackers, malware, and other intrusions that could compromise your information and your firm's reputation. And to break down the potential threats and the solutions you can use to address them, we got a special guest. Scott Drazen is the Chief Technology and Information Security Officer for Spectrum Health, which is a $6.1 billion not-for-profit healthcare organization based here in Michigan. So as Spectrum Health's CTO and CISO, uh, Scott's responsible for leading Spectrum Health's enterprise technology and information security functions. Scott joined us this month to share what he's learned addressing and mitigating technology-based risks for Spectrum Health. And Scott's also going to outline some solutions you can use, uh, regardless of the size of your law firm and regardless of the level of your resources you have available, to give your firm the best chance to withstand cyber threats and other types of security risks that could compromise your sensitive data. Before we get started with Scott, just a quick reminder. If you don't already know us at Lafleur, we're a full-service digital marketing agency that works with law firms across the country to develop their brands and grow their businesses. To learn more about us and check out other great content, including additional episodes of this podcast, just visit our website. We're at lafleur.marketing. That's L-A-F-L-E-U-R dot marketing. Okay, let's join Scott Drazen in the podcast studio and talk data security solutions on Legal Marketing Radio from Lafleur. Okay, joining us on the podcast this week, uh, we have someone who hasn't been on the podcast in a little while, but has been a guest in the past. We got LaFleur founder and president, Chip LaFleur. Chip, how you doing? Pretty good, Stephen. Thanks. And then uh, our main guest this week is Scott Drayson. And Scott, if you don't mind, uh, just to get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what your background is, and what kind of work you do? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I uh, am the Chief Technology Officer and Chief Information Security Officer for Spectrum Health System based here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we're a large uh, $7 billion enterprise comprised of 14 hospitals. We have several thousand physicians in our physician group and a million member health plan. So it's uh, I've been working in the healthcare IT industry my whole career, almost 28 years now. Um, and I've been working for Spectrum Health the past 12 years, um, and I serve in that senior vice president role, overseeing all the infrastructure operations and enterprise security for the organization. Got it. So, so what does that entail, like on a, a day-to-day basis? What is your work really like? Well, a lot of what I do is um, sort of working on what we call the CIA triad, if you will. It's uh, working in, in supporting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all of our data and systems for the organization. So being a very large um, health system that spans much of the western half of the state of Michigan, um, my job entails dealing with all of the core t- foundational technology environments or data centers, all the technologies that work within the data centers, the teams that support that technology, our networks, telephone systems, all that type of um, equipment and and technology. And then I also have enterprise security, which is responsible for managing all of our cyber threat management and all the um, protections we have in place to manage our sensitive data uh, for which we're stewards of. And then the uh, alignment with all of the governance risk and compliance obligations we have with both the legislative um, uh, requirements as well as contractual obligations for our customers. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's really about ensuring that all the systems that we need to function as a health system are, are running and available at all times because they're so critical to the care delivery process and then ensuring that all the data we manage is safe and secure um, on behalf of the millions of patients and members that we serve. And uh, so let's apply that a little bit uh, and kind of pivot to talking about law firms. So, you know, law firms in a lot of ways, like other businesses, however, um, they do have some special considerations where, you know, client data security is of a heightened interest to them. So, you know, given that in mind, you know, what are some of the biggest security Mm -hmm. threats that you would say face a business like a law firm today? Well, a lot, a lot of the threats that are that are affecting us nowadays, I would split into a couple different categories from from a law firm point of view. Certainly, um, managing the confidentiality of the 
uh, of the customers you have for that law firm and all the data and the contracts and the legal um, legal issues you're dealing with is highly sensitive for those um, those customers. And so ensuring that data is protected and secured. Um, you also have, especially for smaller practices, likely typical challenges that would face many organizations in terms of um, how do you maintain and ensure that the systems and the technologies you're using in support of your practice are, are safe and secure and that you're not going to compromise the data that you have. So um, in many ways, there's a lot of similarities um, for organizations, whether they're very small or very large. And oftentimes, it's just a matter of the resources you have available to you um, to try and mitigate the risks that you're faced with that, that end up differentiating the big, big companies from the small ones. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, assessing threats and evaluating, you know, what you really have to deal with, where do most threats come from for a business like a law firm or really, I guess, any business that we're talking about? Well, in, in um, what we really look at as opposed to threats um, is really thinking about the risks that an organization has and understanding where your risks are because knowing what your risk profile is will determine um, how you manage and mitigate those those risks. And threats can be one of those, but not all threats are equal. Um, from a cyber threat perspective, clearly you've got um, nowadays nation state actors, organized crime syndicates, and other criminal activities um, taking place on the internet where they're not necessarily targeting per se um, small businesses or legal firms or healthcare systems for that matter. They're just seeking any opportunity to take advantage of uh, available resources to compromise an organization, whether that be to gather data from you, um, to harvest uh, financial information, um, uh, other resourcing that can help them um, um, you know, take advantage of individuals and their identities to generate income and revenue. Um, and so a lot of times those types of cyber threats um, are more broad scale, but they can be very impactful. Uh, ransomware is a good example where you may not be targeted specifically, but because your device just happens to be insecure or, or um, you haven't managed the risks that are related to, to ransomware, your device gets uh, gets affected, and that can have a material impact on your on your legal firm and your practice with your clients because it can be devastating both operationally as well as financially. We've had that. We've actually had that happen to a client of ours. So it was, um, I think it was a little bit before we started working with them, but they got hit by ransomware, and the ransomware made it through their email system to their server. Yeah. yeah. And they had daily backups, and they were following a lot of best practices. Um, except that their backup solution had a character limit to the directory tree, like uh, to the file names. The depth. Yes. So the the backup solution did not back up, you know, and you think about like the structure of how you keep all these things organized, which yeah. I think ties into a lot of what you're saying. Yeah. Because they had these huge file trees to keep, you know, records related to different cases and to in private information and things like that, the cases that or the the files that had too long of a file name were gone. Yeah. And they were not recoverable. Yeah. And so, you know, I worked with them to try to help them through through some of that. And that's obviously not the primary thing that we do, but um, it was it was pretty devastating mm -hmm. um, to them. They went through a long period of trying to recover it. They went through the process of trying to track down, you know, the originator. Um, they considered paying it off, you know, to try to get it back. Um, and in the end, they ended up having to walk away from a good chunk of data that, that just disappeared. Yeah, unrecoverable. Yeah, that does yeah. happen. That's that's the very unfortunate part of a ransomware type of experience. Um, but you'll never forget it if it happens right, to you. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, they put they put better solutions in place for sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, since we're talking about ransomware, um, you know, I'm not super well versed in how that works. But my understanding is uh, ransomware would most likely be, you know, you'd That'd be uh, something that would happen because of an employee behavior or something, right? Like most likely someone downloaded something, opened something that exposed your system to that kind of threat. Um, so for an average business, would you say the bigger risk points are come from internal, come from employees, you know, opening things, downloading things, or committing other behaviors that kind of can compromise the system? Or is it are external threats, you know, something... No, that what you're describing certainly is a significant risk and a threat for most organizations, um, which is why some of the precautions you can put in place to help mitigate the risk of that happening are so important. Um, and especially given that some of them are very not difficult to implement. Um, when you have a scenario like, like what Chip described, 
Um, I'd be willing to bet it was probably a malware that got um, that someone was phished yep. um, with an email. And so the malware came out of the network. Um, and then from there, they were able to move laterally and it was able to spread across the rest of the internal network. And there mm-hmm. are things you could do to help mitigate that risk um, to, to reduce the likelihood of it happening. So it's not um, it's not that an individual who is doing something on purpose to to bring the malware in, but right. they're they're falling prey to an email that that is a phishing email that's getting them to go out and try and enter their credentials or to download an application or a document that's got malware on it that would compromise their local network. Um, I'm willing to bet the customer you're referencing probably didn't have antivirus or malware running on their computers that was up to date, or they didn't have systems that were patched yep. um, all, all the way. And so the malware was able to take advantage of a, of a known vulnerability to get through and, and, and manifest across the rest of the network. And those are some of the simple things you can do, you know, um, ensuring a, you've got password complexity and uniqueness. Um, and a lot of times I recommend to people that use a password manager to, to remember all of your different passwords. There are many good technologies out there available today to help you with that. Um, ensuring you have um, two-factor authentication on all your accounts where possible. Uh, I can't stress that one enough. That can do so much to mitigate the risk of um, someone harvesting credentials from an individual and using those credentials to lock back into a system and, and get access um, to technology or, or information that they shouldn't have. Um, keeping your systems um, and your, your operating systems and your applications patched currently is a huge, a huge step forward. You would be surprised how many um, cases that you see reported in the press um, are really related to devices that weren't patched effectively because more often than not, as, as sexy and interesting as what are known as zero-day um, uh exploits are, they're very infrequently used. Um, oddly enough, they actually have a very high monetary value on the, on the black market because- well, What's a zero day? Can you uh, just- uh, Sure. A zero day exploit is, is, a, um, is a vulnerability that's being exploited that no one knows about yet because okay. whoever discovered it hasn't reported it either yeah. to the original manufacturer or, or publicly to the press to make people aware that it exists. And so you'll find those types of exploits to be very valuable because it gives um, the threat actor, whomever that might be, whether it's a nation state or a, a criminal- uh, criminal uh, actor um, an advantage because most of the um, preventive measures that would be able to protect against that type of exploit aren't known yet because they didn't they didn't make the uh, the exploit known and so those types of things do happen but rarely when you see it in the press are those the types of events that are that are um, the the cause of the issue more often than not it's a malware that's taking advantage of an of a known exploit that's out there and an organization just didn't patch their devices to protect against it and that's what made them vulnerable. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So, you know, you, you're you're part of an organization. Obviously, you have a department. You have a bunch of people who are working for you, who are making sure that all of the pieces and, and parts are in place uh, to prevent issues, to minimize your risk and things like that. When you think of like a small office that may just be three or four people or a mid-sized office that may be under 20 people or one that's going to be between like 50 and 100 people, mm-hmm. how do you how do you start out? You know, as a small organization with maybe just a few people uh, that work for the organization, what are the things that that group of people does to help their clients feel secure? And then what is the what is the next stage and the next stage look like? You know, how does that scale up? Because I mean, I see, I see attempts to break into our system. You know, we have what twenty four people who work here now, um, of varying complex complexity. Some of them pretty good. Um, I think we're a pretty tech savvy group of people here. Um, and it's security is hugely important to us. We try to do two factor authentication where we can, um, thanks to some of your good advice. Um, but how do you start out as kind of a small organization? Because data security for a law firm where it's a lawyer and a legal assistant is equally as important to their clients as it is, you know, to the client of the 5,000 person law firm. So how do you start off with that small firm and then how do you scale up? What's the, what's that succession look like? Well, I I think there's certainly a a fundamental level of, um, uh, effort you can put in that's fairly low cost. Um, and so things that we've talked about, um, having password uniqueness and, and complexity requirements so they're not easily guessable passwords, 
Um, many of the breaches in uh, over the last several years, if you think about like the Experian of the world, where 150 million Americans had their information compromised, I'm pretty sure most of the um, people listening to this podcast are probably among those who had their data compromised. So you have to a, already assume that your data is out there. So don't use passwords that you've used before or that are easily guessable because the dictionaries that exist of all those passwords on the internet are, are easily accessible and, and exploitable. And so that would be an easy way for them to get through. So pass Password complexity and uniqueness. Again, the password managers can be really effective in helping you create complex passwords that you don't have to remember that the technology can help you um, when it comes to entering those on websites. Um, like you mentioned, two-factor authentication is a significant uh, advantage because if your credentials are guessed um, or if someone did get them, uh, unfortunately, if they were to try and log in remotely to uh, a legal firm's technology environment, they wouldn't be able to get in because the second factor of authentication would prevent that type of access. So that becomes a, a significant uh, component. Um, yeah, patching um, all your devices and keeping them current at the operating system level and then with your, uh, with your applications if you use them, a low-cost solution but highly effective in ensuring that known vulnerabilities can't be exploited in your environment. Um, running antivirus and anti-malware software on all of your computers, um, another very good way to ensure that the common um, known vulnerabilities can't be exploited. Um, you know, criminals and, and the, the dark market, are, are they, they tend to be like water where they'll follow the path of least resistance. And so more often than not, you find them uh, gravitating towards those systems where those vulnerabilities exist and they can take advantage of them. Um, as you start getting more complex to a larger organization, you start thinking about things like um, asking for encryption on all of your devices, you know, your workstations, your laptops, most of the common operating systems. You can employ encryption to ensure your data on your mobile devices is encrypted. So if you lose that device, you're not going to compromise the, the information that might be on there that's sensitive to you and or your, your clients. Um, enforcing... Um, uh, pins, device pins on mobile devices. So if you're allowing mobile connectivity to your technologies, especially if they're cloud-based like Microsoft's Office 365 suite, ensuring that people who are connecting to your corporate resources have a pin on the device so that if they lose that device, someone can't get on the device and start accessing their corporate content. Um, you can start then layering in other protections that complement things like your email system, where you could get another solution that sits in front of your email systems that helps separate out the legitimate email coming into your organization from that, which is, is bad. And it really helps um, drop the amount of spam mail you get coming in. So in our organization, as an example, 84% of the mail that comes to our organization never gets delivered to an inbox at all wow. because it's just automatically filtered out because it's mm -hmm. junk. Wow, that's wild. It's amazing. That's it's crazy. astonishing when you think about it. The volume is, is tremendous. Um, and then you can start layering in other technologies that will look at the um, inbound email as an example and analyze the attachments to make sure the attachments don't contain malware or that the URLs that are referenced in the email are coming from legitimate websites and aren't trying to trick you into going to other locations. So those types of things become more complex um, technologies that you can employ in large organizations that have the budget to, to do that type of thing. And small organizations, a lot of times you don't. And so um, employee awareness and understanding becomes a very big part of your program in terms of education and understanding to look for things that look unusual in email. Um, a lot of scams, um, and I, I can tell you of some very large um, uh, peer organizations that I've, uh, I'm aware of that have fallen for this, where they'll get invoices that come into the organization that look like legitimate invoices, but they're actually not. They're rerouting monies and payments to bank locations. And once they figure it out, it's too late. You've lost that money. Um, I'm aware of an organization on the West Coast of the U.S. that several years ago fell prey to that uh, scam through a fax communication with wow. a perpetrator who convinced them to wire um, a total of $5 million to a bank overseas. Oh, and right. they did so and never saw that money again. Wow. That's so, crazy. Then they're very clever because they, you know, the criminals are doing a, a lot of work to make the invoices look very, very close to the original. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it becomes easy to trick you. Um, another common uh, attack method is for people to uh, do what's called typo squatting, where they'll use a domain name that's very similar to your organization's, but with a very slight character difference that comes from an illegitimate source, and they'll send it 
um, from someone that looks like a leader in the organization asking another person to do um, something for that leader that um, may appear somewhat reasonable, even though perhaps a little unusual, but enough that people will, will convince they'd fall for it. And that wire transfer is a common approach where you might get an email from what looks to be the CFO or president of the organization saying, would you please wire transfer X number of dollars to this account for me? Um, and they're very good about doing it because a lot of times they'll monitor the social networks of those people and they'll know when they're going on vacation and they'll send those emails while the people are on vacation. Wow. So they're not there then to ask the question of to say, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Does it not? Um, so, you know, maintaining a healthy awareness for those types of activities and being uh, and educating your staff um, to look for those things, to be right. curious about what they're reading and, you know, uh, trust but validate, yep. uh, if you <laughs> yep. will. That makes sense. And and that's, you know, just, just kind of to the point of like, you know, obviously like you're seeing, I would assume thousands of threats on an ongoing basis. Um, but we've been hit by that one. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't fall for it, fortunately. Um, but on several different occasions, um, people who work here have received emails that looked like they're coming from me. Uh, and the first one is very benign. It's, Hey, could you do a task for me? Um, it comes from me to someone who's on the team and it looks like something that I might ask. Um, and then we've had people respond to that email, you know, with a sure, you know, what do you need? Um, and then the next request is to go and buy iTunes gift cards. Yeah. Right. And so, and that's where it stopped, you know, here, because I think we do try to pay pretty close attention to that. Um, but it very easily could have gone the other way. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody could have, yeah, sure. That's kind of weird, but yeah, I'll go do it. Um, and because they did a great job. They found out exactly what the relationship was and we're not a huge company, you know, right. like, and they still were able to, and they still were able to track down to the point. So I'm, I'm very curious. Is that, is that an actual human being who's, who's doing that search and who's finding kind of the organizational structure? Um, or is that some sort of an algorithm out there that's, that's just spewing these things out or is someone actually looking us up to, to do it? I think you're finding those types of that type of social engineering as people are researching the leaders in their organization. They're they're crafting that communication with those wow. people to try and deal with that. Um, we're starting to hear about you know uh, how artificial intelligence and machine learning will will come into the cyber realm for illicit purposes and starting to learn and understand how that might be because I've seen um, demonstrations where whole chat bot sessions were done with AI where wow. the response and uh, the response of the chat bot was in context with the question and the way the person was answering the question okay. in a way that when you looked at the conversation stream, if you didn't know it was a, an AI based chat bot, you would have a hard time discerning that it wasn't an actual human being. So you're going to see more and more of that um, over the next several years improve to a degree where it becomes very concerning to, to be able to differentiate mm -hmm. from a real person or a, a machine that mm -hmm. you're having a dialogue with. And that might be trying to do bad things to you. It makes a lot of sense. I know that, you know, one of the things that I think people use to kind of help them sleep at night is this idea of just kind of being lost in a sea of targets, right? Yeah. And so you talk about that experience, what it was, Experian? Yes. Um, that Experian breach, you know, and you think, well, you know, that doesn't really count for me because they're not going to look me up and try to find you know, what I might have or try to find a login. But I think that that also ties into what you just said, where as soon as you start to introduce some of the machine learning algorithms that may, you know, increase the likelihood that someone is going to be a target, just like, you know, we use machine learning to try to identify, um, we built a model anyways to try to identify um, what would be paying cases versus non-paying cases on the personal injury side. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden you took this, you know, database of 40,000 records and you spun it down to about a thousand or two thousand that looked like the best candidates. Well, now that's you know, thirty-eight or thirty-nine thousand entities that you don't even have to touch. So if you're in that sea, it seems like it's going to increase the likelihood that you could be targeted. You know, yes. as some of those things yes. start to roll out because you could do them to scale, right? In a scale that's that's un unmanageable. Um, we have a service that. Um, works to look for threats that are coming into our environment and or look, looking for what are called indicators of compromise, which are signals that there might be something going on that you need to look at. And amongst all the logs that our different technologies and systems um, produce, for a human to be able to do that is, is, is impossible given the volumes. And so just to give you a, an idea of the magnitude, in the fourth quarter of 2018, that service we use where we ship all these logs, they analyzed 80 80 or more billion 
logs um, wow. from all of our technologies and distilled that down to about 49 specific um, indicators of compromise that then they could turn back to my team and say, okay, based on our analysis, this is what we think you need to look further into. And then we could take those 49 and really do the investigation to determine whether they a legitimate threat to us or not. That's wild. And, and manage it. And so that kind of um, analysis and that capability at a high level um, will continue to improve over time. Right now, in many respects, it's um, it requires a lot of investment to get mm-hmm. access to that type of service. But um, much like, you know, many years ago when they were doing the genome mapping, that was, you know, a million dollars to map right. your genome. But nowadays you can, you know, pay 23 and me, you know, 30 bucks and you'll have it done in a matter of weeks. The same thing will happen in this space where more and more of this um, learning capability will help you. Um, there is an example where, where at, on a simple level, you could take advantage of a service that Cisco offers. It's a product called Umbrella, and okay. it has to do with the name, uh, domain name resolution when you're trying to relate the URL that you go mm-hmm. to visit with the actual IP address of the device. And uh, they're, they bought an open source company called OpenDNS. And you can use it as an individual. I use it in my home mm-hmm. home environment, um, and we use it in our corporate environment, the corporate version of that product. But that um, allows you to do name resolution with a service that is looking for and filtering out all those bad actors and those um, domains that might be dangerous for you to to connect to. So ones that might be distributing malware or be a threat or danger for other reasons like that, and it gives you an ability to use that service and know that you have another layer of protection mm-hmm. because. Um, cybersecurity management really is is about what's called defense in depth, meaning layer on different layers uh, and types of, of capabilities and technologies to protect yourself in hopes that um, it would take a very, very highly specialized um, path to traverse all those different layers of protection you have to actually do something that would harm you. And so, um, you know, if you if you want to use the Shrek analogy, ogres are like onions. You want to have your defense model be like layers of an onion where you keep mm-hmm. peeling back layers and each has a different type of protection that in totality will mitigate most of the risks that you'd likely be under for, for a threat. That makes sense. And, and those, the things that you've listed off, I think, through the course of this conversation are not hugely technical things to implement. Yeah. You know, I've... I've I think that our I think that our router is set up to use Google's DNS, mm-hmm. um, but after this, I will go and change it. <laughs> but you know, but that and it sounds Actionable like takeaways. Oh, for yeah. sure. And that sounds like it sounds like oh man, like I don't know what DNS is. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. You know, but that's just a setting in your router, yeah. and you change one number in in or a couple numbers in one spot, right? Right. Um, and you have your IT person do it, or if you manage your own network, you just go in there and you do it. And what a layer of protection. Right. The other thing that, you know, some of your comments are kind of kind of driving back home to me, it almost is like making the case for using like a cloud-based um, Office 365 or Google Apps. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of following what you're saying and wondering if this, wondering what your take is on this. But, you know, I see a lot of things now in, in our Office 365 implementation um, where I get warnings that an email is coming from an external source. Um, and I don't, I don't recall turning those things on necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have, you know, I do recall turning on, um, if, if Outlook sees that you're starting to enter like, uh, financial information, the credit card numbers or personal information, like, uh, like a social security number, it's going to issue a warning. Mm -hmm. So you can send it because it doesn't know exactly what you're using those digits for. Um, but it's going to pop up something that says, Hey, just, you know, be aware you're starting to do this. Whereas if we just had an exchange server that we self-hosted, if we had an email provider, you know, from one of the bulk email providers where they don't do a lot of management there, it seems like our risk is reduced a little bit by using something like Microsoft or something like um, Google, um, you know, Google business apps. Is, is that the case, do you think? Or? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yes. Um, I think the benefit you see from the platforms like Microsoft or Google is that they have the um, ability to invest in those types of protective abilities for your service. And some of them have differing levels of licensure requirement. Um, and so it, some do cost a little bit more than others. But by and large, 
it's going to be a far more effective strategy, especially for smaller size organizations to leverage um, those types of uh, providers because uh -huh. they can give you services that you on your own would otherwise have a either a difficult time um, managing and, and dealing with uh, and the complexity of it, or or you wouldn't have them at all, uh -huh. potentially. Um, and that's why you see a lot of organizations, my own included, which are migrating to you know platforms like Microsoft Office 365, because that benefit exists. Um, there's a lot of value in the platform and how it integrates, um, gives you ease of access for mobile, um, uh, many web-based solutions, as well as your traditional you know, office suite, if you will, on your desktop um, to work with. But then the security capabilities and protections they build in definitely help you and serve you well uh, in, that, in that way. That makes sense. We get we get pushback sometimes from clients about the cost, you know, related to Office 365, which we use. Yes. Um, but I also look at the different scenarios that we've run into and just for the one client who got ransomware, like what was the cost of that? Yeah. You know, and you're going to spend 15 or $20. We, we use um, Office 365 E3, mm -hmm. you know, and you pay a couple dollars more per month per user. But the fact is that like if even if even if you get a lawsuit and all of your data gets you know they, they need a snapshot of your data, the business can continue to operate. Correct. You know you don't know what's going to happen there. Um, and then there's threat protection and things like that that I've seen on the back end. And we don't have an IT department. You know it's us. It's mm -hmm. um, Dave Anwa and I are kind of the primary people there. But it seems like it provides a lot of layers. You know, kind of speaking to as many layers as you can layer up without having it create you know, just an impo impossible business situation, it seems like it gives us quite a few of them. Yeah, I think it's high value. Um, you know, we have a saying when we talk about risk in organization that uh, in many respects, we are going to do the things that we have laid out in our security program, um, whether we do it of our own volition in the way we want to at the pace we want or because we have a breach and then we have to because there is a um, a mandate to do it by a governing body that's that's responding as a result of that breach given the magnitude. So, do it do it of your own of your own accord or be forced to do it. You're going to spend the money in the long run, one way or the other. And if you're forced to do it, I guarantee the money um, spent will be far greater uh, uh, by significant multiples, if not orders of magnitude, than it would be if you did it on your own. So, I agree with you. It, it may appear a little frustrating that some of the pricing is a little high. But I, I also would argue, especially for smaller to mid-sized practices, the alternative, if you were going to try and roll your own, if you will, and build your own solution, will end up being far more expensive than what you're paying for through a service provider that's going to do it in a much more effective way for you. Yeah. Makes sense, especially considering at law firms, I mean, the email volume is huge, and I would imagine that's, you know, one of the biggest potential sources of risks that they have. So um, I just want to go back a little bit because we talked about how the training and awareness piece is so important, especially at a smaller practice. And I think a lot of the uh, lawyers who listen to this podcast have these smaller practices. So how do you manage that when you don't have any expert on staff? You know, you don't have an internal IT department. You don't even have, you know, maybe anyone who's really that knowledgeable about it. Um, are there, you know, particularly beneficial services you can work with to get that kind of training? Um, how do you recommend they go about that? There are there are many organizations that do that type of um, training for for customers where they can provide the awareness and education and development training. It can be fairly simple. It can be complex. They will tailor it to your particular needs. Um, part of it starts with having sort of a fundamental policy for your organization, and I would recommend that as a good starting point for um, firms and practices that don't have one is establish a security policy that lays out your expectations for all of the employees in your organization so they understand what's acceptable, what isn't. Um, and there's there's clear guidance on that from their point of view, especially for law firms. I doubt there's going to be an issue with creating policy statements that would um, fall along that that lines. And then you can work with external resources from a training and awareness program that could be incorporated into um, fairly small and short but um, productive interactions with each employee in a way that it's not intrusive. Um, it's also not a once a year type of activity that is done once and then forgotten about. If you can infuse it throughout the course of, um, of a year, that would be beneficial. There are services also where you can do um, uh, targeted phishing campaigns for education and awareness. So for example, in our organization, um, on a monthly basis, we will send out several thousand um, fake phishing messages 
um, to to our organization. And if people click on that phishing message, they will be then taken to a message that tells them, hey, you, this was a test. You clicked on this phishing message, and then it will provide them some educational content um, that describes how to be more aware of what phishing is, how to look for it, and, and find the signs of it. So you can um, then report it as a phishing message to um, to our department instead of clicking on it and falling for falling victim to it, and so then we'll we'll provide small little rewards for people who are actually reporting the the phishing attempts to us, saying, "Hey, this is a bad thing." And there is a um, there was a story, a real real story um, I heard within the last uh, I think it was middle of last year. There was a woman at a company um, who was uh, received a message and looked at it and thought it looked suspicious. Knew her company had been doing um, phishing campaigns, and they had a reward program out for people who reported a phishing message that you could be put into a, a drawing to win an iPad. And so, wanting to win an iPad, she submitted this phishing message to her IT organization, thinking it was one of their phishing campaigns. And lo and behold, it comes to find out that in fact, no, it wasn't a phishing message. It was actually a legitimate message that had she clicked on it, would have downloaded malware, malware that contained ransomware wow. that could have put their whole organization at risk. And so her her diligence in following through and reporting that to her IT organization made a huge impact on them being able to prevent what could have otherwise been a very bad circumstance if that had gotten into their system and, and made its way around the organization. Wow. Did she get the iPad anyways? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely hope so. She, she deserved it more yeah. than that too for right, the amount right. of money she saved that company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so um, let's pivot a little bit to talking about before we have to wrap up here. Um, let's say the worst does happening, or excuse me, let's say the worst does happen, and a law firm, you know, discovers that they've experienced a data breach. They don't know the extent of it yet, but they, you know, get wind of it basically. Um, what is the best way to respond to something like that? How do you go about that? Well, typically what you'd want to do and, and as a, as a, um, preventive measure for that type of scenario, it'd be helpful for firms to have established a relationship with, with professional security firms um, so that, A, you could use those firms for your own, um, your own purposes and, and consulting when you need assistance or help in configuring your security environment and programs, but also so that if you do have an actual event where you need to investigate it, you can bring in some professionals who can uh, follow a structured process for how to determine um, what what happened? Um, was it? Is there something still going on? Because sometimes the initial indicator of an event, um, even if you resolve it, doesn't necessarily mean there isn't something else that's also happened in the environment that you may need to be aware of. So you'd want to have some help uh, externally by professionals that would help you evaluate the rest of your environment to ensure there aren't other signs that you have something going on that you need to resolve. And then they can help you work through a mitigation plan depending on the circumstances and type of event for how, how best to take action and then what you might need to do with respect to your customers and your clients um, if there might be data compromise or data loss as a result of whatever event may have occurred. Yeah, makes sense. So as an organization here at the floor, like I feel like I've purposefully tried to implement a more paranoid than less paranoid approach to security. Um, and I think that that's served us really well. I mean, we haven't had issues, but of course we could have gotten this far without having had issues had we not been as paranoid. Um, part of the reason that we do that is because I think that that makes working with us more appealing. You know, if you're a, if you're a law firm and you know that your data is going to be safe, um, you're going to, you're going to be more likely to work with us. Right. Um, but it also kind of brings up the question of, what about the security that you receive from the third parties that you work with, partners, um, service providers, things like that? How do you try to vet a service provider to make sure that they're going to be as careful with, with your data or your client's data as you will be? That's a very good question because um, that can be a significant um, weakness in um, relationships and, and security postures that organizations may have, as most of the uh, listeners are probably familiar with the target breach that happened several mm -hmm. years ago, was the result of a third-party uh, HVAC vendor that had been compromised, and that was how they got into the target environment. Um, and so you know, when it comes to third-party management, um, there are organizations that you can contract with that will help provide um, services to evaluate the risk posture of um, different third parties as part of your contracting process. So in our organization, we have two different vendors um, that we use. Uh, one does an initial assessment of, of a company from a high level to give us sort of, sort of low level risk 
risk assessment. And based on that initial assessment, we can determine, do we need to take um, more actions related to further understanding a risk if there's something comes back that, that presents a red flag, or if they come back with a positive uh, review, then we are less concerned there, there would be risk. If we have a, a more comprehensive relationship or contract being considered in terms of the amount or type of sensitive data that's that's um, part of that contracting process, we have a more elaborate risk review process that, again, we use a third party for to help us do that. And they follow a structured um, questioning process with the, with the third party to understand and evaluate that risk to help us make sure we understand if there are issues, how to deal with them. Um, and then it comes to applying that knowledge to your contracting process. And so um, where you look at your, you know, where we traditionally run into challenges with third parties in negotiations is um, related to um, uh, limitations of liability and indemnification clauses within uh -huh. contracts, because many times the third parties are trying to push risk onto us as the customer that right. we're pushing back saying, you know, we're not comfortable with what they're asking of us. And we have to go through negotiation to achieve that. We often ask for certain levels of insurance limits. Uh -huh. Um, to ensure that if they do have a breach, that there is coverage for the costs that we have, uh -huh. both direct and indirect, depending on the nature of the contract, um, to protect us in that event. Uh -huh. And then we have legislative requirements through the HIPAA legislation that require what's called a business associate agreement. And that um, that deals with um, the third parties ensuring they're applying the same um, privacy practices to our sensitive right. data that we do in, in our organization as we're contracting with them for services. So um, uh, that doesn't obviously necessarily apply to many of the listeners unless they're in the healthcare specific you know, practice, um, which, which in which case it may. But I think in general, having good contracting support when you're negotiating with a third party to protect yourself mm -hmm. and provide that coverage you need is critical. I think, I think it's pretty, I think it's actually more applicable uh, than you might think, because I mean, no, especially on the personal injury side, they're dealing with medical records all the time. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. there's some HIPAA compliance requirements there. Yeah. Um, and then you touched on insurance too. You know, that's um, we as an organization carry insurance against data breaches and data loss and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I always kind of assumed that other firms like ours would do the same, but I'm finding that that's not the case. Um, so if you're a lawyer out there who's working with an agency that handles some of your confidential data, which the agency probably does if they're doing a good job of what they're doing, then they really should have a rider on their insurance like that. I think it just makes sense um, because we we get we get a window into oftentimes at least lead, at the lead stage. You know, as a lead comes in, you know, the marketing agency is almost always going to be able to see that. There's going to be personally identifying information within that, and there could even be you know health uh, details that mm -hmm. should stay that should stay confidential. So. You know, the question of, well, do you have do you have insurance for data breach or data loss? It seems like a pretty reasonable question to ask an agency that you work with. Yes. And yeah. if the answer is no, then I'd encourage them to go get it or I'd, or I'd look elsewhere. Yeah, cyber insurance is, is increasing in, in frequency, I think, in a lot of organizations. Um, I know we certainly have a cyber insurance um, plan. And an interesting side effect, I think, of that experience, likely for folks um, who are pursuing it, because I know we, we find in our case, is that your cyber insurers are asking you questions about your security posture and your risks to understand um, how to how to price the policies and what type of coverages mm -hmm. to play. So that becomes important. Um, they also then become a resource for the customers of those plans, because many times your cyber insurance will have pre pre-established relationships with um, third parties that do security consulting services or um, uh, risk risk remediation or risk response to events, things like that, um, and that can be helpful because it becomes. Um, an avenue for you to become aware of those types of resources that might be more challenging otherwise if you're not familiar with them. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. Um, I feel like in particular Chip and Scott could go for a long time here, <laughs> um, but you guys will have to do it over a beer because we're going to have to wrap up. Um, Scott Drayson, we really appreciate your time and you coming on the show. Thank you for everything. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And Chip, thanks for joining us too. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right. That's it for this month's episode. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Scott Drayson as much as we did and that you're feeling a little more confident as to how your firm can address some of these always evolving cyber threats and other types of security risks. As always, if you've got a question or a suggestion that you want to see addressed on a future episode of this podcast, just send an email to radio at lafleur.marketing. All right. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget to check back next month for another new episode. 
We'll see you next time on Legal Marketing Radio from LaFleur. Fleur.